The Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s began a period of growth of African American rights and involvement. Started as a result of the Great Migration of African Americans from the South to the North, especially Harlem, New York, to avoid increased racial tensions brewing in post-Civil War South. This sudden mass of African Americans allowed them to express their culture more freely and comfortably, and black artists embraced the culture and created many new art forms. In addition to this spur of artistic creation, African Americans and other minorities continued their fight to gain equal rights. Despite lack of progress after the stock market crash of 1929 and during World War II, African Americans have fought for and achieved rights since the Harlem Renaissance and continue to fight for equality across the nation in many aspects of everyday life. Immediately following the Civil War and the emancipation of most of the slaves, of the slaves who were emancipated, many were far from free. Continued racism and oppression from wealthy white landowners led to sharecropping, a process in which the landowner provided land, tools, food, and whatever else to the worker, who in return gave the landowner a portion of the crop, dragging many former slaves into a vicious cycle of owing the landowner more than they were making. On top of this, African Americans in the South faced discriminatory legislation that kept them from exercising basic rights as Americans. An example of this would be the infamous Jim Crow laws, which provided African Americans in the South with a separate but equal status, supported by the Supreme Court in 1896 with the Plessy v. Ferguson trial that was in no way equal. Laws included prohibiting a black man from shaking hands with a white man, which would imply social equality, and blacks were not allowed to show affection publicly. Laws similar to these varied from region to region in the South, but each contained the same principal goal. In Jim Crow Guide, Stetson Kennedy describes general rules included in many of the Jim Crow laws. Never assert or intimate that a white person is lying. Never impute dishonorable intentions to a white person. Never suggest that a white person is from an inferior class. Never lay claim to or overly demonstrate superior knowledge or intelligence. Never curse a white person. Never laugh, laugh derisively at a white person. Never comment upon the appearance of a white female. Needless to say, life in the South was dismal for African Americans. In an effort to leave the racial segregation of the South, African Americans flocked north from about 1910 to 1930 in what became known as the Great Migration. The cultural influence started by this migration sparked what would be decades of progress for African Americans that would eventually put them on, at the very least, an even legal playing field with everyone else. The first civil rights legislation passed was the Civil Rights Act of 1957. Facing violent responses in many southern states, most notably Virginia, Eisenhower was forced to send troops to protect African American children as they were integrated into public schools. This act was used to show federal support to the Brown v. Board of Education decision about the integration of public schools. This was still a relatively conservative act, mostly due to the continuing mindset in much of the southern United States. Next was the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Following the Birmingham campaign, a series of nonviolent protests led by Martin Luther King Jr., James Bevel, and Frank Shuttlesworth, emphasizing integration of African Americans on one of the most racially divided states. John F. Kennedy called for the bill first in 1963, calling for legislation giving all Americans the right to be served in facilities which are open to the public, hotels, restaurants, theaters, retail stores, and similar establishments, as well as increased voter protection. Kennedy took the bill to the House of Representatives, but because of his untimely assassination, the bill was not passed in the House until Lyndon Johnson took it to the House later in 1963. Johnson saw the importance of the bill and made sure that its passage in the Senate went quickly. In general, the goal of this act was to outlaw discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin, and to end unequal voter registration requirements, and to end segregation in schools, the workplace, and public property, while expanding the power of the Civil Rights Commission set up by the Civil Rights Act of 1957. Predictably, the bill was met with significant backlash from independent southern business owners who felt that the government had no right making rules for them to follow as who they had to serve on their own property. When asked about losing support in the South, Johnson said, quote, I know the risks are great and we might lose the South, but those sorts of states may be lost anyways. Later in his presidency, Lyndon Johnson would pass what the U.S. Department of Justice calls the most effective piece of civil rights legislation ever enacted in the country, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Designed to protect voting rights guaranteed in the 14th and 15th Amendments, the act exponentially increased political power for minorities, especially those in the South. A major part of the act was that it prohibited state governments from creating and imposing laws that discriminate against a voter's race or language, and expressly outlawing literacy tests and other measures to keep some group of people from voting. It also included provisions to keep Southern politicians from redrawing electoral districts to lessen the effect that minorities would have on the election. The final of Johnson's Civil Rights Acts was passed April 11, 1968, and is aptly named the Civil Rights Act of 1968. 
Passed in the midst of the King Assassination Riots, and known more commonly as the Fair Housing Act, the goal of the Act was to increase enforcement of the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which prohibited discrimination concerning the sale, rental, and financing of housing based on race, religion, and national origin. Interestingly, a writer attached to the bill makes it a felony to travel in interstate commerce with the intent to incite, promote, encourage, participate in, and carry on a riot. After this act, the next example of major racial ch change occurred in 1991, when the ever-so-cleverly named Civil Rights Act of 1991 was passed after a series of Supreme Court decisions, Patterson v. McLean Credit Union, Ward's Cove Packing Co. v. Antonio, Price Waterhouse v. Hopkins, and Martin v. Wilkes, limiting the power of workers suing their company on grounds of discrimination. The act combined elements of the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and the Civil Rights Act of 1964, both of which, while attempting to end discrimination in the workplace, approached the issue very differently, as each protected only a few groups of people. This act combines major ideas of the acts, made the issues time appropriate, and now protects people of all race, gender, language, etc. in the workplace. Since the Harlem Renaissance, African Americans and other minority groups have banded together and fought the rampant injustice present in America. While they are infinitely closer to their goal of true equality than they were 80 to 90 years ago, racism and discrimination still exist in America and the world, and strides are being taken to make sure that each person is judged on their actions and who they are rather than by their race.